In 2015, a young man living in Honduras made his way to the local cemetery and he found his wife's gravesite and he leaned up against it and he quietly began to cry. Seconds later, something would happen inside of that cemetery that would not only cause the young man to go silent, get up and start running, but it would also be caught on camera. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button to come to the zoo with you and then cover them in honey and push them into the bear enclosure. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's stories. In the spring of 2021, 52-year-old Texas resident Karen Davis got married, and then after the ceremony and after the honeymoon, she went through the process of changing her last name from Davis to McBride to match her husband's last name. After the change was done, the last step was to get a new driver's license with the new name on it. So Karen emailed the local DMV, or Department of Motor Vehicles, to set up a time for her to come in and make the change to her license. But after she sent that email, email, the local DMV immediately emailed Karen back and they told her that they could not help her with this request until she resolved an issue. Now, they didn't specify what this issue was. However, they very cryptically said it had something to do with the state of Oklahoma. And then at the bottom of the email, there was just a phone number they told her she needed to call in order to resolve this issue. And so Karen's thinking, okay, that's pretty weird, but I did used to live in Oklahoma, so that probably has something to do with it. And so not thinking much of it, she punched this number the DMV had given her into her phone, and then she let it ring. A few moments later, much to Karen's shock, a woman from the Norman, Oklahoma District Attorney's Office picked up the phone and said, how can I help you? Karen immediately assumed that the DMV must have made a mistake, that maybe they were trying to give Karen some other number in Oklahoma because this was an Oklahoma problem and they had mistakenly given her the number to the DA's office. But since she had this woman on the phone, Karen told her, you know, hey, I was just trying to get a new license in Texas. They told me there was some sort of issue. It had to do with me potentially living in Oklahoma. I don't know what it is, but this is the number they gave me. So I'm sure it's a mistake, but that's why I'm calling. The woman from the DA's office had no idea who Karen was, but after taking down Karen's information and looking on her computer, she discovered Karen's so-called Oklahoma problem. And after she explained to Karen what this enormous problem was, Karen literally couldn't believe it. But after this woman went over the details a few more times and really showed Karen that this Oklahoma problem was very, very real, suddenly everything in Karen's life made sense. For the last 22 years, Karen, who was incredibly smart and friendly and polite and never had a problem with anyone, had an incredibly hard time getting a job. Even jobs that she was extremely qualified for, she would get turned down for for someone who was way less qualified. And then in the rare times that Karen did actually get hired, she would always get fired for no reason. And so Karen never understood why she was being treated this way until now. It would turn out 22 years earlier, which is when Karen's hireability issues began, she lived in Norman, Oklahoma, which is where the DA's office was that she would end up calling 22 years later. And when she was living in Norman, she lived with a roommate. And this roommate was this nice young man who had a couple of young kids. And one weekend, he went to the local movie store called Movie Place, and he rented the hit 90s movie, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, to watch with his kids. And after he was done watching this movie, he didn't return the VHS tape of Sabrina the Teenage Witch back to Movie Place. Now, normally when this happened, the movie store would just hit the card holder with lots of late fees, which was actually great for the movie store. They made lots and lots of money on individual people that just forgot to return their movies. And if the card holder just continued to hold on to this delinquent movie, at some point, the movie store would just hit them with a final fee that basically accounted for the total cost of the VHS tape that they had effectively stolen. And then at that point, the matter was resolved. The card holder owned the VHS tape, whether they knew it or not, and the movie store simply moved on. But in this case, 
movie place in Norman, Oklahoma, didn't think that was enough. And when Sabrina the Teenage Witch was not returned in a timely fashion, they pressed charges against the cardholder. And the cardholder was Karen Davis. The roommate had just borrowed her card. And somehow, these charges against Karen were never brought up to Karen. She was never contacted by anyone. And so for 22 years, she was technically a wanted felon. Meaning, every time one of her employers, either during the interview process or after she was hired, when they would run a criminal background check on her, it would pop up she was wanted for felony embezzlement. And so this was the reason she kept not getting jobs and kept getting fired from jobs. Since discovering these charges, Karen worked with the Norman, Oklahoma DA's office and got these charges dismissed. You know what really makes me want to slap the like button with a tasseled wobble gong? Inflation! Prices are going through the roof right now, which is why I'm excited to partner with Current again. So thank you to Current for sponsoring today's video. Also, stick around to the end of this sponsored segment because I'm going to be sharing the best like button gags you all sent me a couple of weeks ago on Current during our last cash giveaway. Current is the mobile banking app that, unlike boring old banks, they actually help you take control of your money, which is more crucial than ever right now. Old banks, just like the like button, they just charge you fees and slow you down. But with Current, there are no monthly fees and the app is super easy to use. And while other banks earn you basically nothing on your savings, with Current, you can earn over 40 times the national average. Because of the strain inflation is having on all of us, Current and I are giving away $2,500 to you all. For a chance to win part of the $2,500 giveaway, all you have to do is click the link down below, download current, and then use my code BALLIN250. And now here are the top five like button gags we received. My favorite was from Regina. Please invite the like button to the zoo with you and then cover them in honey and then accidentally push them into the bear enclosure. Okay, back to the stories. In the early evening hours of December 24th, 2011, so Christmas Eve, 26-year-old Zazel Preston sat on her bed in her little apartment in Anaheim, California, and wrapped Christmas gifts for her children. Laying next to her was her newest addition to the family, her third child, a seven-week-old little boy. This Christmas was a big deal for Zazel. It was also a big deal for her husband, 30-year-old William Wallace, not only because it was going to be the first Christmas with their new son, but also because this was the first Christmas after Zazel and William had reconciled their relationship. They had been married for the past three years, but over those three years, their relationship had been very unhealthy and toxic and at times abusive. But earlier that year, when Zazel had discovered that she was pregnant, this baby became kind of like a new anchor point for their relationship. It was like suddenly they could put their differences aside and just focus on raising their kids together. After wrapping her final present, Zazel hopped off the bed, she scooped up her little boy, and then she headed out into the living room where she met up with her husband and her two older children, who were little girls aged three and eight, and then they all headed outside and went next door to celebrate Christmas Eve at a party with their neighbors. Early the next morning, so on Christmas Day, Zazel's two oldest children, the two girls, they got up early and they rushed out of their bedrooms and they ran down the hallway into the living room where their parents were waiting for them on the couch along with their baby brother. The living room was completely decked out with Christmas decorations that the family had put up over the past couple of weeks. The Christmas tree was in the corner with bright multicolored lights and ornaments all over it. There were wreaths on the wall and other string lights around the top of the room. And then over their fireplace were all of their stockings nailed up, stuffed with goodies. The little girls squealed with delight and ran around the couch and took up spots right underneath the Christmas tree and they grabbed their first present and they turned and looked at their parents on the couch and they saw their dad kind of give them a nod of approval, which meant, okay, you can start opening your gifts. And so the girls happily began tearing into the festive wrapping and then after each of them had their brand new toy in hand, they turned around reflexively to show their parents. And so William, he sees the toys and he says, oh, they're so 
great, guys. And then when the girls, they look at their mother and they show her the toys, she doesn't even react. She completely ignores them. And so at some point, you know, these little kids, they start yelling for their mom. Hey, mom, check it out. Look at this new toy. But Zazel just sits there. She doesn't say a word. She's just sitting back on the couch, completely ignoring them. Finally, the eight-year-old turns to William and says, what's wrong with mommy? And at this point, William pauses, and then he gives Zazel a scathing look before very bluntly saying to these young kids, mommy got drunk and now she's ruined Christmas. The girls knew from William's tone of voice that their parents must be fighting. And so they did what they normally did when this happened, and that was to just try to ignore it. And so the little girls, they turned away from their parents and began opening more presents, doing their best not to disturb their parents who were sitting silently behind them. And then a little after 9 a.m., after most of the presents had been opened, William abruptly stood up and walked into the other room and placed a phone call. And then a few minutes later, there was a loud knock on the front door. The night before, after Zazel and William and their kids had left their neighbor's party and come back to their apartment, Zazel and William had gotten into a vicious fight. And by the time the kids had all gone to bed, the fight between the parents had become very physical. Neighbors would recall late at night on Christmas Eve hearing this very loud commotion coming from Zazel and William's apartment. And at some point, apparently Zazel had tried to run out of the apartment, but William had chased after her and hauled her back inside. The sounds coming from their apartment would eventually stop somewhere in the wee hours of Christmas Day. And then as the sun came up on Christmas Day, Zazel and William had made their way to the couch and they were sitting there with their seven-week-old baby waiting for their two oldest to wake up and come open presents. Except when their two little girls came out of their bedrooms and bombed into the living room to begin celebrating, only William was alive. Zazel had been beaten to death by William. And after he had beaten her to death the night before, he had dragged her into the living room, set her up on the couch to make it look like she was sitting, and then put sunglasses on her eyes in order to trick the children. And so all morning, as this three-year-old and eight-year-old are opening these gifts and turning and showing their mother with excitement, she was dead the whole time. But at around 9 a.m., William realized his charade was not going to last because his kids were really keyed in to there being something wrong with their mother. And so that was when he got up and he called 911 and he told them that his wife had gotten drunk and fallen into a glass coffee table. And so she was hurt. And so a little bit later, the police and paramedics, they arrive, they go inside and right away they can tell William is lying to them. There's more to this story than they're being told. And so ultimately, William would be convicted of second degree murder and he would be sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. As for Zazel's three children, they are now being looked after by her parents. In August of 2015, 16-year-old Nacy Perez suddenly woke up in the middle of the night. As she lay there scanning around the dark, tiny room that she was in, it dawned on her that the most likely reason she had just woken up is because she really needed to use the bathroom. And so she climbed out of her bed and she began carefully walking across the room where her other relatives were sleeping on the floor as she moved towards the back of the house. Nacy lived in a town called La Entrada, which is located in one of the poorest and most dangerous countries in the world, Honduras. But despite the harshness of her reality, Nacy was pretty happy. She had recently married the boy she was in love with, his name was Rudy, and the two of them were both very excited about their first child, which was due in a matter of months. So Nacy reached the back of her house, she pushed open the back door, and she stepped out into the hot night air, and then she made the familiar walk across her backyard toward the outhouse. But Nacy would never reach the outhouse. The next morning, Nacy's mother woke up first, her name was Maria, and as she passed by the back door, she looked outside and she saw Nacy lying on the ground. And so Maria, she screams, she runs outside to her daughter and she flips her over and she's looking at her and Nacy is unresponsive and she's foaming at the mouth. Now, they're in a part of the world where healthcare was not top-notch, not even close. And Honduras is known for being an extremely religious part of the world. And so Maria did not think, oh, I should send my daughter to the hospital or I should call a doctor. 
Instead, Maria and the rest of Nacy's family, who had all streamed outside because of the commotion, they decided to call a priest to perform an exorcism because the belief was Nacy must be possessed with demons. And so a priest was hailed to the residence, and the priest would perform an exorcism on Nacy, but it wouldn't do anything. And so at that point, Maria and the rest of Nacy's family would take Nacy, who was still totally unresponsive and foaming, to the local hospital. But by that point, it was too late. Nacy was dead. When Nacy's family asked the doctors, what happened to her? They said they didn't know. And so heartbroken and confused, Maria and the rest of Nacy's family brought Nacy back home. They had an ad hoc memorial service, and then they buried her. The following day, Nacy's husband, Rudy, who was totally distraught because he has not only lost his wife, he's also lost his unborn child. He got up early and he just had to go to the cemetery to be with his wife. And so he made his way over to the local cemetery and he found his wife's gravesite. Nacy had not been buried under the earth. Instead, she had been placed into a coffin, and that coffin had been slid into this big hollowed out cement block that was as big as a coffin. And then once the coffin was slid inside, they walled up the opening. So basically her gravesite was this kind of freestanding big cement block. And so Rudy finds Nacy's cement block, and he goes up right next to it, and he leans up against it, and he begins to quietly sob. But just seconds later, he would hear something in that cemetery that would cause him to go completely silent, stand up, and sprint away. The day before, approximately one or two hours after Nacy's coffin was slid inside of that cement tomb and walled up, Nacy woke up. She was never dead. It's unclear what originally caused Nacy to collapse outside of her house on the way to the outhouse, but the two leading theories are, one, she had a severe panic attack caused by a nearby gunshot, or two, she had a severe episode of cataplexy. Cataplexy is the sudden, uncontrollable loss of muscle function, often brought on by very strong emotions. A mild case could be just having your knees buckle for a second. A severe case, which is what they believe could have happened to Nacy, would result in basically complete paralysis. But whatever the case was, the doctors at the hospital got it wrong. When Nacy was brought to them, she was not dead. And so when she woke up inside of her coffin that was encased in cement, she began shrieking and trying to pound up against the inside of these tight walls that were pressed up against her. And at some point, she even managed to force her hands up near her head and she shattered the glass window that sat in her coffin that looked right down at her face. She broke the glass, but it didn't help her at all because again, it's just cement on the other side. And so glass shards fell into her mouth and into her eyes. And so she stayed like that, screaming and trying to fight her way out for over 24 hours, trying to get anybody's attention. But nobody heard her until her husband, Rudy, he leaned up against her tomb and he put his ear right up against the cement and began to cry. And that's when he heard through the cement, the sound of his wife calling out for help. Rudy instantly ran and got help and he and his family came back and they broke open the side of this tomb and they pulled Nacy's coffin out. And even though she was now unresponsive, she had a faint heartbeat. And so they rushed her to the hospital, but by the time she got there, she really had died. Nacy had finally just run out of oxygen, likely within minutes of her husband finally hearing her screams. So that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button to come to the zoo with you and then cover them in honey and push them into the bear enclosure. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss our weekly upload. We now have a podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast that puts out brand new, never before heard podcast exclusive stories on Monday mornings. And then on Thursdays, we put out the remastered audio from our best YouTube videos. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, basically anywhere you get podcasts, you can find this one.
We also have two additional YouTube channels. One is called Mr. Ballin Shorts, and the other is called Mr. Ballin and Espanol. We post near daily content on our Snapchat and Facebook pages. Those are both just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform. My username on all accounts is at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. We also have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. And if you have a story suggestion, suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, other YouTube channels, the podcast, wherever, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.